we need to go to a conference. Any questions? Friday we looked at what I hope was mostly review, and we looked at pure rotation. Very, very similar to what we did in Physics 1. The only possibility really is that Physics 1 we pretty much stuck to constant acceleration, but here um, not we would not necessarily be stuck to that. But the rotational business is so similar to the particle business that there you go, it was worth one one day, one day only. So any questions before we we take our next step beyond just rotation? So now we're gonna look at general plane motion. General means that uh, most anything can happen. There's lots of possibilities. Uh, it's not pure translation any longer. It's not pure rotation any longer. It could be uh, combinations of the both. Plane means that whatever object we're talking about will stay in a 2D plane. So the easiest example of something like that is uh, simply a wheel rolling along, a gr uh, along the ground. Uh, if we have some reference line on it, some little bit of time later, that reference line will have slipped through some angle. But that's not pure rotation, of course, because there's no point on that wheel about, uh, there's no point on that wheel that didn't move somewhere. Everything moved at least some distance. Certainly the center moved that far and whatever other points that we could look at. Uh, that was just some random point A. Then A would move that far. I guess we should put a displacement on those rather than a... And uh, uh, all possibilities of uh, the types of things could have happened with that. We're also going to be concerned with the uh, angular acceleration of the wheel, which may or may not be constant, of course, and the associated velocity at any one point in time, uh, remembering that not only is there a velocity relative to the center, but there's going to be some velocity of the center itself and it's the combination of those things that's going to give us the true velocity uh, of, of that point. And we're going to be able to do this for any, any point as we go through these. So we're going to look at this in, in two different ways. First, we're going to start with absolute motion analysis. And then tomorrow, we'll look at relative motion analysis, and we'll stick more with that. <coughs> because it'll allow us to do some more complicated things. Absolute motion analysis is very good for uh, single things like uh, wheels, uh, mildly compound things like a two-gear system or a, a one-gear and a linkage, that type of thing. Whereas the relative motion analysis will let us do a lot more complex things as we go through it. So, our absolute motion analysis. Uh, and we'll stick with this this general example of a wheel turning. It's it's one of the most uh, one of the easiest to do. Um, first, we need to sort of set up a uh, a a uh, a procedure for looking at these, uh, and then we'll go through a couple problems where we do just that, if possible. Locate some point 
that travels a prescribed path. If it's a straight line, that's as, about as good as you can do. For example, the center of the wheel travels a straight line. So that's a nice place to start um, the analysis. For very general motion, this might not be a, as easy a step as it might seem. But for our, for our time here to get started, uh, most of the ones will be able to do something like that. Second, sort of makes sense, align the coordinate system with that path. So we have this, this wheel rolling to some later place. We know that the center takes a path like that. And so we'll line up our coordinate system with that. And that's just what we'll do in a, in a second here for more of the analysis. That'll help with the uh, linear position, but then from that, uh, after that, we're going to have to determine angular position. And it may be just as simple as, as picking some, some uh, arbitrary reference line and then seeing what that does as the, uh, as the, wheel, as the wheel moves. Once we've got those two, essentially two coordinate systems, the, the linear uh, translational um, reference frame and then the angular one, then we need to relate those two. So we want to relate S to theta and then from there we'll be able to relate uh, uh, V to omega and A to alpha and we'll be able to put the whole problem together. Now, uh, sometimes that step's a little bit easier said than done, but for most of the problems that we're going to do are, are fairly straightforward. All right, for example, this problem, if we allow it to turn through some angle, and we let it do so, expect it to do so without slipping. Things are much different if it does slip. But we'll let it do so without slipping. Then uh, we've already got the coordinate system laid out. Now we've got an angular position and uh, hopefully it's not too big a stretch for you to remember then that the distance it traveled uh, will actually be how much arc length rolls by and then those two are related in just that way. So that in itself is one of our no slip conditions. This would not be true if the wheel was slipping on the ground. That's going to be important to us. Um, I don't think we'll do any problem. I don't remember any problems coming by that, uh, that have any kind of slipping with them. So if we're talking about gears of some kind, then uh, that's definitely a no-slip situation. Because right? that's the, the intent of the gearing. You say ours, the arc length? Ours, the radius. Sorry, the radius of the, of the wheel. So that's okay. Remember, this this only works if uh, theta is in radians. 
this does not hold if you have theta in degrees. And then it's easy enough to continue it from there. We know that the velocity is the time rate of change of the position. R is a constant, so this becomes then the the sort of the velocity equivalent of the uh, no slip condition. Again, uh, now omega is in radians per second. And then the acceleration is the next step beyond that. Where we remember, I hope. Uh, well, this is this is. I guess without saying, uh, this is the acceleration, the the position, velocity, and acceleration of the center point, since that's uh, where we pegged everything. Um, and then we're going to have to, uh, if we look at particular points, we're going to have more than just this acceleration because not only are these points translating, the center is in simple translation. Where that may or may not be constant. Uh, however, every other point is not only in translation, but also in rotation about the center as the center itself translates. And so we're going to have to put that together with it in, uh, in our more complex analysis. So these are all of the, the center point, I guess we could call it G, sort of for center of gravity type points. And then for each one of those three things to hold, that either requires or confirms the no-slip condition, which is going to be real important to us as we uh, as we go through this. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna redo that analysis in uh, a little bit more detail now, because that that's uh, simple enough for just the center, but for any other point on this object. We need to know more than just this. This is the velocity, position, acceleration of the center. We're going to need to know more. Not too bad. Not too bad for a hand-drawn circle there. All right, so there's, there's the initial position of our wheel. We're going to uh, use the same coordinate system. And let it roll. I'm not going to draw uh, the, the floor necessarily. But then we're going to let there be a reference line that looks something like this. So I'll label that point A, that point B. Give it some angular velocity that will cause it to roll along that surface. Okay, nice, nice and big. I hope you're, hope you're drawing them nice and big. Medium big there. All right, it's some little bit of time later. It will have rolled to here. All right, and gotten all flat lumpy. That's a little better. That'll do. And that reference line, let's say it has rolled to something like this. So we'll call that A prime and B prime just to, just to help us with the notes as we're writing this. So That's then an angle of something like that. 
it's rolled that distance. Okay, so some radius r, some angular speed omega, some little bit of time later it's gotten to there. All right, let's see what we got. Um, the center has traveled from there to there. I guess we can call that G to G prime. So let's see. Uh, we'll, we'll let that be our distance x. So x equals G to G prime. What else does that equal? It equals uh, this arc length, V all the way down to this bottom contact point, which of course is R theta. So it's traveled that far. What else can we make out of it? I think that's all we need for there. All right, but let's put some other, that, that's no more than we had over here, but let's do a little bit more with it. Let's see. Let's uh, figure out where point A is now, or A prime as it's called uh, later, but uh, it's the same point, just different spots in time. Let's see. Uh, it's a distance x, which is just what the center did, but there's a little bit more distance added on to that, which is what r cosine theta. Is that right? Here, I'll put in, I'll put in the r theta rather than the x. R theta plus R cosine theta in the x direction. Right? Is that where point A is now? And it's in the y direction, it happens to have gone down. And so that's. Uh, minus r sine theta. And that's in the j direction. Uh, actually though, let's see. If, if theta happened to be less than 90, We'd actually want this to be a plus, wouldn't we? Because it would be above our point. That would then be theta. That would be... Wait, right, that's cosine theta, isn't it? Yeah. Got these backwards. Look at it this way. If it only rules to here, then we need g to g prime plus r sine theta. And it'll be above by r cosine theta, so we do want that to be a plus. And then if theta happens to go greater than 190, then this turns minus automatically and it's still okay. That make sense? Help us out here, Alex. You went to a math conference. Is that about right? That's, a that's, that's right. That's about that's beautiful. That's what that is. Okay, so I think we're all right with that. Okay. So that's that's where point A is at any time or not any time. We don't have time on here yet. Uh, but that's where it is at any position. So now we want to know something about the velocity of A.
that's the time derivative of that position vector we just established. But that's got uh, a couple things going on in it, though. So that's going to be DRA d theta d theta dt. Because r is not a function of t, it's a function of theta. Not too big a deal, because what's this little beast right there, d theta dt? That, of course, is our angular velocity omega. All right, so we need to do that, that derivative. All right, first piece is r, which is constant, uh, then theta dot, which is the same as r omega. The second piece, R again, is constant, so it's uh, derivative of this with respect to theta, which is cosine. So that's dr d theta of this first little part, d theta dt which again is omega. So that's the I component. Not missing any signs yet. Okay, we're all right. And then we need to do the derivative of the J part. R is constant, so this is just uh, sine theta d theta dt. dr d theta, no, uh, took the derivative of this, dr d theta, this part, remember when you take derivatives, you can do each part as you go, so this is, that is just this one, r sine theta, the derivative of that is cosine theta, and then d theta dt of the inside part, because it also varies with time. It's a product rule. I think that's what you call it? Chain rule? Um, oh yeah, chain rule. I thought yeah. in this right now you take the derivative with respect to theta. And then you multi can you just like multiply them that entire yeah. thing by that's the derivative with respect to theta. And then that's d theta dt. Because that's the chain rule. But uh, if when you just take the derivative with respect to theta and then multiply that entire thing by um, uh, d theta over dt, which is omega, in order to uh, get almost the same thing, but then the r omega to be r omega squared. That's what's confusing me. Uh, why don't I do that? Because it's not right. How do you is that? Where, where would, where's the extra omega come from? There's only one. I'll ask it after class then. Well, my answer will be the same. I do it this way because that's what is, what, what works. That's what's right. That's the uh, chain rule. Anyway, I can uh, factor out omega, uh, r omega, 1 plus cosine theta 
I plus sine theta j. Which one? The uh, second one at the zero x. It's cosine that sine is a negative sine. This one? Yeah. yeah. That one's negative sine. Okay. Oh yeah, because the derivative. Yep. All right, so we have a general expression for the velocity of some point A. Now, we're going to find a general expression for the acceleration of some point A. And then we're going to take a look and see if any of uh, what's contained in there is stuff we uh, stuff we need and we're stuff we need to remember. All right, so we need to do the derivative of that piece there. First part we get uh, r e omega e t, which is r alpha for this part plus r cosine theta no it's going to be a minus r sine theta uh, omega because that's there plus another omega so that's an omega squared Minus r omega. Yep. Minus r omega sine theta. And then uh, this part taken as constant, just that part, which is plus r cosine theta omega in the i direction. Let me check it. R alpha. R cosine theta. This is our cosine alpha. Let's see. R alpha. And then, let's see. Then we took the r and omega as constant to the derivative of the cosine. That's the middle part. Then there's another d theta dt. Then the third part was we take this as constant. And just that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's not omega, that's alpha. That's what you're saying, Dewey? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, I part. The J part, uh, it's going to be a little simpler. We've got R sine theta, alpha. I'll pull the minus sign out. R omega cosine theta d theta dt, which is another omega. Let's see if that looks right. R alpha sine theta, yep. Plus omega squared cosine theta, yep. Okay. Okay, good. All right, I think we've got all the pieces. Now, everybody 
everybody okay with that? Now we've got the three, the three possibilities. So let's check them. It's something we either already know or something we're going to find as very, very useful. So at theta equals 180 degrees. So that's where our wheel A and B is now gone through half a turn. That's useful to us because that means now we're going to know the velocity and acceleration of the contact point. That'd be really useful if this wheel was a gear. Do you know what a, uh, a rack is? Uh, there, there are some gears that run on racks, which are sort of linear gears, so that the rack can move and oftentimes the gear is fixed and now we can associate the acceleration of the uh, rack with this contact point because the contact point is always, of course, at the bottom. It's also where our no-slip condition is. So let's check it. Uh, our, the position of point A. Uh, 1 plus cosine of 180. Minus 1, right? Minus 1. So that cancels. We have R omega 1 minus 1 in the I direction. Are we trying to find the velocity of point A or the uh, radius vector of point A? No, the, the location of point A. So, wait a second, something's not right here. Because that says it hasn't moved at all if, if the I position is zero. So, what's wrong? What? Cosine 180 is zero. Cosine. No, cosine 180 is negative one, right? All right, so don't look at it. Why are we using that equation instead of the one to your left? Oh, yeah, that's the velocity equation. There's the trouble. Phew. That makes Yeah, let's use the right equation. Sometimes that helps. So we've got, what's, uh, what's 180? Uh, that's, that's pi. So this is pi r. That's this part. Sine theta of 180 is 0. So that disappears, so it's pi r i, and this is minus 1. Cosine of 180 is minus 1, so that's minus r in the j direction. Is that where point A is? <coughs> it's a distance, here, let's use this picture. It's a distance pi r, right? Half the circumference it rolled. So that makes sense. And then it's down a distance minus r. So that makes sense. So that worked okay. Right. That, that's no surprise. We, we knew that's where it was anyway. But we got some more, so a little bit more to learn with these next two pieces. Velocity of point A when theta equals 180 degrees. So it's r omega times 1 plus minus 1. in the I direction. Minus R uh, sine theta of 180 degrees is also zero. So this is plus zero J. What then is the velocity 
of point A at the instant when theta equals 180 degrees? Zero. The contact point at any instant is not moving. A moment later, the wheel has moved somewhere else, but that's a new contact point. You can also see it as, uh, well, if the wheel's in contact with the ground and not slipping, and the ground's not moving, then of course the contact point has no velocity. So that's something we're going to be able to use. But you've got to remember it. That's going to come back to us. We're going to need that. Not so much, uh, I don't think we need it so much again today, but we are going to need it in uh, starting uh, Wednesday, with, or Friday, with the relative motion. All right, the acceleration of point A, when point A is at the very bottom, that instant it's there, we've got R alpha minus sine 180 is zero, and cosine is minus one, so that's r that's minus r alpha. So there's zero x direction acceleration of the contact point. I think that makes as much sense as it not having any velocity. Let's see what happens next. Oh, we've got a minus. Minus r sine theta, that's zero. r omega squared cosine theta of 180 is minus. So we have two minuses, that's a plus. r omega squared j. Well, that part cancels. Uh, the acceleration of point A is r omega squared j. So uh, here's the contact point plus j. It's got an acceleration of r omega squared. That's the moment. That's what? The moment. No, there's another name for it than that. Centripetal, that's the centripetal acceleration. Remember, centripetal acceleration was r omega squared. So that's the centripetal acceleration. It's, yeah, it's normal to the surface, uh, but that's where the center of that circle is. So at that instant, that point A is in uh, a simple circular motion about the center. An instant later, that point doesn't really exist anymore. There's a new contact point. So don't think that since the contact point has zero velocity, the wheel's not moving. That's not true. At that instant, the contact point is, has no velocity. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see how we can use that. How that's going to look to us. At any instant in time, this point has zero velocity. The center has velocity of v, whatever the velocity of the wheel is. If that was your car, that's what we'd see as the velocity of the car. What velocity does that point have? Let's see, that's when theta equals zero. So we could put all those pieces in here. Uh, cosine of zero is what? One. So there's actually a, an r omega plus an r omega. That's two r omega. 
and that part's zero. So it has some velocity, 2r omega. What is the velocity of the center with respect to r and omega? It's r omega. So the top point is going twice the velocity of the middle point, and in fact, we can even draw a velocity profile, and we can figure out the instantaneous velocity of any point along that diameter at that instant. That's useful if we need to hook something to those. If there's, if that's some kind of gear or a, a cam or something and we need to hook something there, now we know the velocity and the acceleration of uh, any of those points. So that's useful. What do I want to do? Let's keep that. Man, you guys are going to be good at drawing circles today. Alright. So that was our absolute motion analysis. Since we knew that the center moved along a prescribed path, we also had the no-slip condition. And now we know the position, velocity, and center of the contact point at any, any instant in time. Okay, so let's do another problem. Imagine we have a, a, a cam. It's a circular cam, however, it doesn't rotate about its center, it rotates about a point right there. In contact with that, at a level, point level to the uh, mounting center, is a spring-loaded rod that, uh, spring-loaded just so that it'll follow. It'll stay in contact with that wheel. Like an indicator might, or like uh, uh, something you'd need so that you get a, a periodic motion perhaps in a manufacturing machine somewhere. And that, those rollers just hold that, uh, hold that thing nice and level. So as this cam turns, remember it rotates about this point, not about its own center. As that cam turns, this will go in or out depending upon what, the, uh, what its contact does with the uh, with the cam itself. We'll also give it the possibility of some acceleration too. Alright, you can imagine we're going to need to know the velocity and the acceleration of the rod itself, which of course will be the velocity and acceleration of that contact point as well. Alright, so let's see. Uh, uh, this point will make a good basis for our coordinate system. Uh, 
um, that that rod's not going to go anywhere in the y direction, so that's not of great importance. But it is going to have some velocity here in the x direction. What is this? What is that? It's a cam, an eccentric cam, off-center cam, with a follower. As this wheel turn, uh, as this cam turns about this point, this rod's going to go in or out depending on where it is. Uh, so at some time it might be like that. A little bit later it'll be it'll have moved to there and the rod will have moved to there. Then Possibly it comes back again and we get the rod to oscillate in and out. <coughs> and of course radius, radius R there. So the position here, call it point B, call it center point A, the the Position of point B. Is 2R theta if that angle is theta. Because we have an isosceles triangle there and twice the base will be 2R uh, cosine theta. Y is, is by definition of the setup, zero, and it won't change, so we don't need to mess with that. If I had some nice animation, it sounds like a pain to do. So the velocity of point B, which is the velocity of the rod itself, will be the time derivative of that uh, piece before. Which will, let's see, 2 R is constant. Derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. And then again, d theta dt, which is omega. Because the x position, here's theta, so to there is cosine theta. Oh, I see a theta right. Yeah, no, theta, theta is right here. Uh, like that. The, the, the angle of the line drawn to the center makes. And the acceleration of point B is dBB dt, which would be a little more involved. Minus 2R omega cosine theta. And then we need the d theta dt, which will give us a omega squared. And then taking that as constant, we get sine theta alpha. So we have the velocity and the acceleration of the rod, because that's the same as the velocity and acceleration of point B. Very quiet. You're absorbing this. Pat? Yep. You're in shock? Yep. I 
Yeah, Bob Wire. Yeah. What? Nothing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it up a while ago. Yep. So you're not even writing any of it down? No, I wrote it down. I'll, I'll follow up on this later, but <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of lost. <laughs> I think the more well, examples we do, the better. That's that's a three line problem. They can't. They don't come any shorter than that. Right. Except the two line problem. Well, I got it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, another problem then. Imagine a door is opened by a, a hydraulic actuator. picture and this cylinder extends at half a meter per second. and acceleration of the door when uh, theta equals 30 degrees. Is there going to be an angle from the vertical to the toward now? What? What? I was just asking about that angle. Take your hand over your mouth. I can't hear you. Oh. That's okay. I can play the tape back next week and then answer your question the week after. What's your question? I was asking about the theta <laughs> was... Oh my god, I'll be right back. bloody nose or something. I don't know what. Somebody hit him? Eric, are you, is everybody else okay with this picture? Okay. Yeah, I think he was asking where uh, the angle of theta is. Don't have it there yet. Right. Oh, I guess I better now that I said it. <laughs> That's angle theta. All right, so uh, essentially what we need to know is if we can find the, uh, the speed and acceleration of point B, then we're going to be able to relate that to the speed and acceleration of the door. So I'll, uh, I'll get you started. 
here with the position of the door. We'll call this, we'll call the length of the actuator at any instant S. So we can do the law of cosines. on the triangle OAB. And that will give us then the position S. We take the derivative of that, we'll get the velocity of the actuator, which is a known, and it'll be a function of, uh, or then the position of the door or theta will be with respect to that. Then we can find alpha uh, as well. All right, who remembers the law cosines? Because that will relate S to theta. S squared equals, because S is opposite the angle we have of interest, so that's how the law of cosine sets up. Then what? The two sides, two other sides adjacent to that angle squared. So that's OB squared plus OA squared. Well, we know both of those distances. One's a meter, one's two meters. What's the rest of the law of cosines, remember? What is um, OB? OB, OA, cosine. Cosine. All right, good. So there's there's the the uh, that relates the position, the the length of the actuator as a function of theta. That reduces, because we know some of those things, to 5 minus 4 cosine theta. And that would be uh, meters squared. What? Let's see, that's one, that's two squared, so that's five, that's okay, that's one, that's two, that's yeah, two cosine theta. Where did I get a four? From my notes, that's where. All right, yeah, those aren't squared. You want to explain more? Okay. Now, let's see, the velocity of the actuator is uh, S dot, so you take over from here. This, when you do it, will give you uh, omega as a function of both the velocity and the uh, angle. So you can then solve for omega at 30 degrees and then acceleration just double dot or V dot. Or to keep it S squared and 
take the compressibility. No, what you, it's, it's a distance, it's a length, so you would only want All right, yeah, the plastic. And maybe we'll close enough to make it a get out of class question. See if I left that four in all the way. It is four, right? You didn't remember the law of cosines properly. Oh, that was two. There's a two in there, yeah. So that is four. Good. Phew. Thanks, Jake, for your calculator. Pointed out right in the middle of it where the law of cosines. Alright, so you can take the derivative of this. Don't forget that you have to do the chain rule on the cosine because then we have d theta dt, the omega we're looking for. And as you go through it, I guess it doesn't necessarily show that the units work out. <coughs> See who remembers how to derivate. Yep, because we need the velocity and the acceleration. Each of this will have as part of it omega. So that's how we're going to find omega. And then this little part of it will have alpha. And when you put in values, then you can solve for each of them. Check your derivatives as you, as you go with each other. Take the derivative of that one. Power comes down, reduce the power by one, all that stuff.
that right? know that B equals 0.5 seconds because that's the rate at which that that arm is extending. Uh, Shouldn't it be 2 on the other side there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. No, we put the 4 back in. Didn't we? No, I mean because of that 1 half. Yeah, the 1 half. Yeah. No, this one half is is outside the parentheses, and so that happens first. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just didn't write it in. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what you meant. Hey, you cancel the four and the two, though. That's what we were saying. You cancel the four and the two. That's <laughs> not <laughs> Fond of the four and the two. <laughs> or you can cancel it. Uh, actually, we can make it even simpler than that because this is S. here in the parentheses is S. So it just comes right out. Alright, so you can solve for omega at 30 degrees. That's got to have units of meters. That's got to have units of meters. Now we take DDT. Omega's got to be meters, radians per second. You need the meters per second. So omega's got to be in meters per second. Is that right? Yeah, I think so, if I remember what they wrote. Yep. You know what S dot is, because that was given. And at 30 degrees, then you can solve for omega. So that's the first one. And then you can take the derivative. And uh, probably easier just to take the derivative of that, remembering that one of the parts will be s dot, and s dot we already have. This reappears again. Okay, Alex? Or um, uh, when we take the derivative to get acceleration, can we, uh, do we have to take it as is, or can we put it in data before taking it through? Or you have it to take it as is, because if you put in theta equals 30, this becomes a constant, which when you take the derivative, it's not a constant. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know there you go. What, Colin, you got it? Was that a hand up? No. Who's no? the rumor rating fool? Oh. Now you don't want to put the 30 degrees in yet. To do this, you have to take the derivative of it without the 30 degrees in there. Oh, okay. Oh, you're solving for it. Okay. But we have two unknowns. 
What? This is constant. So A is then zero. What is that? Alpha is the 
the angular speed of the door, whatever that is. And that's not zero. Catch a mistake, Frank, or, or take the rest of the day off? Uh, I get different answers for omega when I solve for like the four omega sent in over two times that one. I get a different answer when I solve for that one and the one below it. The two omega over S times that. Different answer for oh, when these I solve two? For omega, Really? Did we write anything down wrong? So if you put 30 degrees in here, you get a different answer than if you put 30 degrees in here. Well, I do. You do? Okay, well, I, I don't have a calculator. I only did this one, so I don't know. I didn't check that one. get the velocity and then she's checking on the speed.